Hello and welcome to the Cypher Briefs virtual studio. I'm Suzanne Kelly here with our COO Brad Christian and our CMO Alicia Volpe. It's really great to be back here with you again today. Thank you for joining us for this expert driven conversation on climate and national security. It's an issue we've all been talking a lot more about this year and we're very pleased to be welcoming in just a couple of minutes, Admiral Jim Stavridis who is honestly one of the smartest people I've talked to on this issue. He has an incredible wealth of knowledge and he's a true strategic thinker which I think always makes our interactions very enjoyable. First though, an announcement, a few very quick and simple logistics. Climate is an issue on the agenda for the Cypher Brief Threat Conference in late October this year. If you'd like to be a part of that live expert conversation on this issue and other national security issues, we invite you to go to the website at tcbconference.com and submit kind of a request. We do limit the number of attendees just based on how big the space is. And we look for attendees who are truly sort of invested in the national security space, either in the public or private sector. So if it sounds interesting, I encourage you to go check it out. I'd also like to formally welcome a number of former senior national security leaders to this session today. It's really nice to have you with us as well. I'd also like to welcome a number of journalists on the call. Um, today's briefing with Admiral Stavridis is an on the record briefing. So please feel free to quote. You can submit, you meaning everybody else on the call who's out there today, there are a lot of you. Um, please submit your questions for the Admiral by using the link on the webinar page. If you're joining us via your laptop, it's in the control panel section, which is probably on the right-hand side of your screen. There's a chat function there and you can send your questions that way. Otherwise, if it's too complicated, as it often is for me, you can just email Brad. He's at bchristian at thecypherbrief.com. We do encourage you to send your questions in early. Um, an hour seems to really whiz by when you're really passionate about an issue. Uh, so please go ahead and send those in at any time. I'd also really like to thank Lockheed Martin for their support of this briefing. Um, and I'd like to welcome Christopher Geiger. Christopher is the Enterprise Risk and Sustainability Director for Lockheed Martin. And in that role, he leads the Sustainability and Enterprise Risk Management Program which includes like strategy, implementation, and stakeholder engagement. He's been with Lockheed Martin for 20 years. You hardly look that old, Chris. He was previously the chief engineer of the Enterprise Sustainment Solutions Market Segment, specializing in avionics, automated test equipment, logistics information systems, and aircraft ground support equipment. Chris, welcome. We're really looking forward to seeing you at this year's threat conference in October to talk a little bit more about this. And this is a great sort of sneak peek, but. Give us a sense of how you and Lockheed Martin are looking at and prioritizing climate um, as an issue from the private sector. Uh, well, thank you, Suzanne. I, I have a somewhat unique corporate role at Lockheed Martin, uh, leading both the enterprise risk management uh, and sustainability functions. Uh, it's a handy combination when addressing climate change risk. Uh, in the aerospace and defense sector, uh, there's more than the usual uh, industry climate change risk, right? There's climate security. Uh, the physical and geopolitical security implications of the changing global climate. Uh, you know, the most effective and economic response uh, to climate security challenges is to mitigate the root cause, uh, climate change. However, mm -hmm. those global steps to mitigate climate change are also contributors uh, to climate security risk. Uh, the balances of power relating to energy, trade, and technology uh, will necessarily change. Uh, whether due to those physical effects of climate change or the steps taken to stabilize it. An analogy I often use um, is the global financial system uh, going through this exercise of exploring how climate change and potential mitigating steps affect it. Right? Mm -hmm. They delineate between physical risk and transition risk, mm -hmm. where physical risk is the direct result of climate change, but the transition risk encompasses the varied human efforts uh, taken to mitigate climate change, such as the cost of carbon, increased renewable energy, and others. Uh, central banks are integrating climate change into their scenarios, and everywhere you turn in banking, equity, debt, insurance, regulation, uh, both physical and transition risks are under scrutiny and described as cross-cutting or transverse risks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, climate security risk can similarly be classified into these physical and transition uh, categories. And while the U.S. military and defense industrial base, including Lockheed Martin, uh, have an important part to play in mitigating climate change through reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, probably our more critical role uh, is in maintaining national security uh, by adapting to climate security challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many direct 
physical climate security risks that I'm, I'm certain will be discussed on the rest of this webcast. Uh, but transition climate security risks uh, are amplifiers. They exacerbate other risks. Uh, examples include the geopolitics of reduced hydrocarbon revenue or green economy uh, critical mineral supplies. Uh, to respond to these interdependent risks, uh, adaptable and resilient solutions are required. Uh, an emerging example is all domain operations and the associated increased speed of decision making. Uh, with 5G.mil implementation aligned with JADC2, you have speed, security, and resilience uh, to bear in whatever risk topic emerges. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there's a seeming dichotomy of gaining the benefits of the networking and cloud computing and also being capable of disconnected operations in a contested environment. Um, however, that's where defense platform edge computing has to allow information to be fully exploited when present, but also operate uh, independently when needed. Mm -hmm. um, it's no surprise that ways to make national security more resilient to climate security transition risks are also applicable to these other disruptive security risks. Mm -hmm. uh, if climate change primarily amplifies other risks, then the mitigation steps are also likely to benefit that wide range of issues. Uh, which is probably good news uh, in the currently projected flat defense budgets. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's always good to find a silver lining. <laughs> Christopher, um, this is a fascinating topic and actually um, I would love it if you would consider um, following up with this as a column um, for the Cypher Brief where you talk about the transition climate security risk because it is an area that's important and we haven't really you know, dove into as deeply as uh, as we should be. So let's chat about that afterwards. Absolutely, looking forward to it. Thanks Excellent. Suzanne. Well, thank you so much. And here's a little fun fact. Um, Christopher actually played a role at Lockheed Merton early on. We had a little pre-session with Christopher and Admiral Stavridis where um, he played the role of a character that's in Admiral Stavridis' latest book, 2034, which we have both read and is a fantastic sort of imagination of what future conflict could look like. Christopher, thanks for being here. And thanks so much to Lockheed for helping make this happen. Uh, that's an important topic. Thank you for covering it. Absolutely. We hope you stick around and ask questions as well. With that, I'd okay. also like to welcome Admiral Stavridis to the Cypher Briefs virtual studio. He was the 16th Supreme Allied Commander at NATO and the 12th Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, where he earned his own PhD in international affairs. He's currently a very busy man. He's the Vice Chair of Global Affairs and the Managing Director at the Carlyle Group and he's chair of the board of the Rockefeller Foundation. He is a prolific writer. Um, he's written a number of fantastic books, including Sea Power, The History and Geopolitics of the World's Oceans. He wrote Sailing True North, which the Cypher Brief talked to him about in a podcast a, a couple of years back. It's about 10 admirals and the voyage of character which we still don't talk about enough today, if you ask me. His latest book, though, the one I was just teasing you about uh, with Christopher is 2034, a novel of the next world war, and it speculates about a US-China conflict. Admiral, welcome. It's so nice to see you, and we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Well, thanks, Suzanne. Always a pleasure to be with the Cypher Brief. And I understand uh, one of my life mentors, uh, Lieutenant General retired Jim Clapper, former DNI, is on the call. Uh, sir, I'm ready for another squash match anytime. Uh, a great American. I treasure his commentary on CNN and in other locations. And I know he's representative of uh, many friends and colleagues who are listening. So welcome all. He is fantastic and an active member of the Cypher Brief community, which we're very grateful for because he always brings a level of perspective that we don't often think about. So, um, all right, let, let's do just like start with the basics here, Admiral. Um, I hear this a lot. Is there really a connection between climate and U.S. national security? I thought I would throw you like the biggest softball ever since we're into sports metaphors here, but just get us started on understanding the connection between those two things as you see it today. Yeah, and I get the question a lot too, and it the, it perplexes me that people can miss something so obvious. But, you know, you mentioned 2034. I think tension with China is very obvious. Um, the sequel, by the way, to 2034, which we're writing now under contract with Penguin, is 2054, which moves the surviving characters and the plot lines into the middle of the century. That novel is really focused on artificial intelligence, cyber. So that's pretty obvious. To me, the most obvious of all, however, is climate. And um, the, the reason it gets short shrift 
is because, in fact, it's going to be the third novel in what will be a trilogy, 2074. That's mm -hmm. when the climate comes home to roost, if you will. And I always say about climate, it's kind of one of these problems from hell that you can kind of get by the day uh, mm -hmm. and you look into the distance and it looks pretty bad. And there's a human tendency to say, you know, I got all these immediate problems around me. I'll just wait and kind of solve that one when I get there, you know, in 2074, say. But problem from hell, when you get there, it's too late. Yeah. And I think many on this audience, anybody who would tune into a conversation about climate knows all that. But I, I want to begin by simply stipulating that. And if you'll, if you'll give me just another minute, I'll tick down and then we can dive in on any of these. I'd love um, that. Three reasons that I think um, there are significant national security challenges. And often when I kind of roll these out for an audience, people, you can sort of see the light go on and on and get brighter and brighter. Um, start with an obvious one. Climate change is conducive to massive storms and fires. All of that creates lost opportunity costs for our servicemen and women who often end up fighting these things. Um, it undermines our economy. All of that has a significant cost. Number two, the Arctic, the high north. And you know we can have a debate about uh, what's happening and what's causing it. But I'll tell you something, as a simple mariner who has sailed the high north and the far south, the ice is melting. That's just a fact. And as it melts, it's going to open up much more significant geopolitical competition in an area of the world thus far where we've avoided wars. Um, mm -hmm. If we open, if you will, a new front in human conflict, pretty massive one being impacted by climate. Number three, drought. And mm -hmm. here you don't have to be a climatologist to look at what's happening in sub Saharan Africa in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, notably Central America, and realize that as crops fail, people migrate. And migrations often lead to conflicts. Um, so drought, and again, we can unpackage that in more detail. And then fourth and finally, you know, the four horsemen of the climate apocalypse, I'd say fourth, and you know the Admiral's gonna say this, it's the oceans. Yeah. And with with all due respect to Al Gore, who likes to say uh, the Amazon is the lungs of the earth, I don't think so. The lungs of the earth are the oceans in the sense that 60, 70 percent of the oxygen we're breathing comes from photosynthesis in the sea. So as all the climate change affects uh, chemistry, pH, above all temperature, um, as well as the impact on rising sea levels. Um, all of that I'll bundle under the oceans. Suzanne, those are four, I think, pretty obvious, increasingly dangerous trends that have my full attention as someone who thinks a lot about national security. So let's dive into those because I think they're excellent um, sort of points for this conversation. And let's just start right up top with your first one the sort of opportunity cost um, that's involved when your forces aren't ready to fight things that were unforeseen um, that may sort of happen as quickly as climate is causing things to happen with these disasters and storms and wildfires that you mentioned. How do you see um, climate impacting military readiness, let's say, over, and I, I'm not gonna even go out to 2074 um, oh, or 2054. No. No over like the short term, like right now, what do we need to be looking for that are indicators that we really have to make changes quicker than we thought we did? Yeah, I think as you look at a, a typical hurricane season and a typical fire season, or look at the typical temperatures in the summer months, I think um, seven of the 10 hottest summers on record have occurred in the last decade. Um, all of these are just simply obviously rising. Now, you will find some climate deniers or climate naysayers or contrarians who will say, oh, you know, we're in a cycle and it'll revert. And they may be right. I, I just don't think so because 95% plus of the climatologists and scientists who actually study this uh, feel pretty strongly that what we're seeing is not episodic. So if you 
by the premise, as I do, that we're going to see more and fiercer storms. And by the way, I'm coming to you from my home state of Florida. Um, we see this in real time down here. And if yeah. you think back just uh, three years ago, we had a, a triple whammy hurricane that hit Florida, Puerto Rico, and the Gulf Coast of the United States, one, two, three. Um, this was uh, Maria, you, you'll remember the names. In any event, these three storms hit, and it stretches thin the fabric of the responders. So FEMA obviously contracts a lot of this, but at the end of the day, National Guard, Navy ships, um, all of them are pulled into this. What happens to their training cycle when it's interrupted so that they can go off correctly and respond to these disasters? That's what I mean by the opportunity cost. All of that, Suzanne, is before we, we even get to the physical kinetic damage to, for example, Department of Defense facilities. Eglin Air Force Base on the Gulf Coast was flattened three years ago and rebuilt by my good friend Heather Wilson, then Secretary of the Air Force, at the cost of you know tens of billions of dollars. Um, Camp Pendleton, where my daughter, Navy nurse, is with her doctor husband out there taking care of our U.S. Marines. Um, every fire season, they would watch these fires come closer and closer on Camp Pendleton. So there's real physical cost to all of this, um, in addition to the time lost in the training. And there, there's no um, obvious solution to this in terms of you can't, you know, kind of rebalance the training cycle and just make up that time. So I would argue um, dealing with the root cause, which is climate change, makes a lot of sense to me. But is there time, Admiral, to deal with just to really focus just on the root cause? Or are there things like short term that the military does need to be thinking about differently now, including the length of that training cycle? I mean, I understand you're watching it, you know, as events unfold month by month, year by year, but don't you have to be kind of be looking at both at the same time? Yeah, exactly. As um, our colleague from Lockheed Martin was talking about ESG, you're going to see the military increasingly thinking ESG. So let's let's focus on the environmental aspect of that. That means that, yes, you have to build into training pipelines, um, the ability to uh, teach National Guard to be uh, responders to these kinds of things. Your Navy vessels have to carry a different uh, deck load, if you will, if they're going to be capable of responding during hurricane season. Um, you have to have more time built into the training cycle if you can anticipate that you're going to uh, lose time as a result of responding to these disasters. And secondarily, to the other point I was making, you have to harden your facilities. And, and oh, by the way, we'll get to the oceans in a minute, but rising sea levels could put Norfolk Naval Station out of business by mid-century. Um, mm -hmm. All of that requires actions in the here and now to kind of deal with the immediate consequences, but also, you know, see paragraph one about a, a problem from hell. If you're really going to solve it, you're going to solve it at the root cost. You've got to begin on that now. Right. You got you got to solve for it and and be able to respond quickly both at the same time. Completely understood. So the second the second topic on your list is the Arctic, something that a lot of people like to think about uh, what may happen there. You characterize it as a, a new potential front for war. Um, it's pretty obvious that Russia has significantly stepped up its activity there by establishing new military facilities. Um, China is getting in the game in the Arctic. What is top of mind for you as you're watching these developments and the ice melting at the same time? Let's look at the uh, geopolitics of it for a second, which is to say the geography of it. So in the high north, you have two vast front porches on this ice field, right? One front porch is Russia's. They have about half the real estate. The other front porch, who lives there? NATO. So it's US, Canada, Denmark by virtue of Greenland, Iceland, and Norway. Who else lives up there? Two close NATO allies and partners. Um, that would be uh, Finland and Sweden, who both own islands inside the Arctic Circle. So you have a built-in Thunderdome up there on one side, Russia, on the other side, all the NATO players. Now, not so bad when the ice field is extant, hard to get anywhere, 
maybe it's less valuable. You've got submarines playing hunt for red October under the ice, et cetera. But what happens now when the ice start to melt? Hydrocarbons become more accessible. Boundary disputes become more acute. Um, there becomes a, a tendency to want to operate up there and to flow forces to that region. Certainly the Russian Federation is doing so. Uh, the NATO nations are doing so as well. So it's a geopolitical epicenter where because of opportunity as the ice melts, shipping lanes open up, hydrocarbons available, you know, crime is where motive meets opportunity. And therefore, um, I predict, unfortunately, more tension in the high north. Let me close on this by pointing out the distinctions among our front porch, if you will, over here on the NATO side, mm -hmm. very different attitudes toward the high north. My Canadian colleagues will say high north, low tension, not going to be a problem. Uh, my, my very good friend who was chief of defense of Canada, General Walt Natinchik, uh, when I was Supreme Allied Commander, I'd say to him, Walt, you know, we got to pay, you know, a lot of attention up here in the Arctic. And he would he'd just chuckle at me and say, oh, you know, Jim, if the Russians ever invaded uh, through the high north, my primary mission would be search and rescue to save them. You know, and, you know, they have a very laissez-faire attitude up there. It's a hard place to operate. Don't worry so much. On the other hand, Norway, extremely aware of Russian pressure, has um, important boundary disagreements and disputes with the Russian Federation. Um, they would push me as Supreme Allied Commander. You know, Admiral Sakyur, we got to get our eyes and ears up there. We want to deploy up there. We need more intelligence. Um, you know, the U.S. kind of in the middle and as you know, Suzanne, one of our failings is um, not paying attention in that manifest in lack of icebreakers. We're finally correcting that. We've got icebreaking capability for the Coast Guard being built into the FIDIP and so forth. But um, overall, we are handicapped on our side of the front porch, our front porch, if you will, because we don't have a coherent singular view the way the Russian Federation does across, across the sea. It seems to be a kind of a recurring theme when we talk about the weaknesses of U.S. national security policy in general. Um, yeah. Is that so? Let me add one other thought, by the way, because you mentioned China. Um, China has 16 significant icebreakers. Um, they very much see themselves as an Arctic nation. Um, they are. Uh, they have obtained observer status in something called the Arctic Council, which are the nations I just discussed. China is an observer and a significant one. And we would be foolish not to understand uh, China's intent is very much to be engaged up here as well. None of that means we are going to go to war. Or we have to go to war. We got to focus on the Arctic Council, how we can work together, uh, try and find zones of cooperation. But it would be naive to, to believe that there are not going to be increases in geopolitical tension up there. Absolutely right. Um, OK, let's talk about uh, the third item that you mentioned right off the top, which is drought. Um, you mentioned specifically Africa um, migration, the issues that that causes. How might that open new fronts given the tensions already on the continent of Africa, the significant Chinese investment in infrastructure in that country, the sort of rampant corruption um, among a lot of the very smaller countries? Uh, how do you see this playing out in the next coming years? Well, we're kind of watching the movie in real time because um, many observers point to the Arab Spring as really uh, largely the events afterward, at least partly because of drought throughout the region, crop failures, um, tensions created. Now, there are a lot of other causes, to be sure. But um, what you see in that arc of crisis that kind of stretches from Tunisia, and we all ought to be very sad to see what evidently is a failure of the, the one democratic outcome in the Arab Spring, we'll see. But that arc of crisis that runs all the way across through Egypt and then up through the human disaster known as Syria, um, you know, drought has played a, an important part in that. So with that as a kind of example in front of us, of what the misery index can create. You mentioned all the other causes, corruption and um, inequality of wealth and 
natural disasters and so on. But I look at both sub-Saharan Africa, notably along the equator, and similarly in Latin America and the Caribbean, from roughly the equator, which passes, you know, newsflash through Ecuador, equator, mm -hmm. um, up to Central America. Those two areas, I think, um, are going to have significant challenges um, with agriculture as a result of drought conditions. When that occurs, when there are crop failures, typically there's internal strife and then there's migration to avoid the internal strife. And that's, again, part of what's contributing to the pressure on our southern border. So I think those are danger zones. And um, again, to your point earlier, you have to address some of this in the short term, but I think you equally have to play the long game here. And, and by the way, I'll, I'll point out, um, you know, there are going to be winners and losers in the world of climate change um, as follows. Arable land will move north. I mean, there'll be potentially huge swaths of the planet that become arable land. The problem is going to be down on the equator, which is highly populated. Um, if those go away because of extreme temperatures, all the uh, wine growing businesses in North Canada um, are not going to salvage what comes out of the disaster at the equator. Mm -hmm. It's a very good way for us to help kind of connect the dots and understand how this might play out. Um, on on the point that you may have mentioned last, but maybe closest to your heart on oceans, um, let's talk about that because you mentioned it's not just rising sea levels that is the, the problem here, but it's also making sure that you have a, a, a military force and military capabilities that are able to navigate whatever may be coming our way. How are you thinking about that, both short term and then long game? Yeah, let, let's start with rising sea levels. Um, you know, these are these are real. And um, I mentioned Norfolk Naval Station, um, some stunning uh, images uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, um, published showing Bangkok and Ho Chi Minh City mid-century. And essentially at high tide, they're Venice and uh, underwater. And so um, these are big cities. I mean, they have, I don't know, 20 million population between the two, maybe not by mid-century. And so uh, this is very real in these low-lying population centers. It's dramatic to point out that smaller islands, Vanuatu and others will be no longer. Um, here in my native state of Florida, we are watching this very closely. And I think that by the end of the century, a lot of this um, you know, highly sought after beachfront may be, you know, highly sought after infinity swimming pool space. Uh, these are, again, very real. So, so rising levels are quite significant. And I think most scientific thinking believes that's because the ice is melting and therefore sea levels are rising as a result of that. Um, in addition, though, as I mentioned, what I really worry about the uh, you know, the end game uh, outcome here would be uh, a fundamental change in the, in the chemistry and temperatures of the ocean that reduces the ability of um, the production of oxygen, which is 60, 70%, you get different numbers, is created by photosynthesis in the sea. And I talk a lot about this in um, sea power, the history and geopolitics of the world's oceans. Um, you know, it's also influenced, by the way, with toxic dumping. There's a, a plastic field that most on this call will know the size of the state of Texas. I'm not making this up. In the Central Pacific, all of that affects fisheries, affects livelihood. Uh, but again, the, the the apocalyptic threat here would be something that dramatically impacted photosynthesis. So for all those reasons, we ought to be quite concerned about it. Um, and I think those are environmental concerns. How does it play to national security? I think, I think that our navies and coast guards, the big we, the world, I think we all have a vested interest in ensuring that the oceans do not end up, 70, this is 70% of the world, of course, the oceans do not end up as a vast wasteland. And just take the Pacific Ocean. 
it's enormous. You can take all the land in the world and it'll fit inside the Pacific Ocean. It's a vast, vast body of water. I once sailed across the Pacific and for seven days, not only did we not visually see another ship, we didn't have another ship in contact on radar, on a spy radar horizon, I don't know, 60 miles. Um, you know, it's a vast space. And so um, the oceans um, deserve guardians. And uh, if you stop and think about it, we try to guard the oceans with really a handful of ships. I mean, there may be a thousand significant ocean going warships and all the navies of the world added up, maybe 1200. And mm -hmm. that would be like trying to patrol, you know, like New York has, I don't know, 600 police cars. This is 70% of the world. You're trying to guard it with 1200 patrol craft. Um, yeah. We need to do better. Um, we can do a lot with uh, overhead sensors, artificial intelligence, AIS, guidance, all of that. But um, the guardianship of the oceans, I think, is going to be a, a significant project for navies. Again, the first thing I talked about, opportunity cost, um, all of that plays into national security. I think that's an excellent point and another one well worth following up on perhaps we could do for a future um, TCB briefing as well on that guardianship of the oceans. Um, let me get to a couple of questions here from other folks because um, apparently I'm hogging up all the time. Um, and Brad actually has a question for you first and since he's sitting closest to me he gets priority. Sorry everyone we'll get to yours as well. He says as the U.S. shifts more military and national capacity to electric and away from fossil fuels, do you believe the adversary's military strategists are thinking differently about defeating the U.S. capabilities? I love this question because it plays a lot into your book. He says China and Russia have proven they can penetrate some of the most sensitive areas of the U.S. government frequently and attack U.S. private sector with cyber attacks at will. And we've had former CIA and TCB expert Sean Roche from the CIA, obviously, where he did digital there. He's highlighted the risk for us in the past to U.S. infrastructure from adversaries. So how do we avoid a future failure of imagination and ensure the U.S. creates better resiliency on pace with a transition away from fossil fuel capacity? First and foremost, and he used the word in the question, we have to imagine it. Um, General Clapper has said correctly that 9-11 was not only a failure of intelligence, it was a failure of imagination we weren't able to imagine where we were headed. And that's really the genesis of me and Elliot Ackman writing this trilogy of books, 2034, Conflict with China, 2054, Cyber, Quantum Computing, Artificial Intelligence, 2074, Climate. You have to begin by challenging the military in the context of this question to imagine that future, imagine all the challenges we ticked off in the first part of the conversation. Then the second thing you have to do, um, equally important, is construct solutions. So to the point of this question, we need, we the United States have got to focus on artificial intelligence, in my view. It becomes central to everything we're going to do. As quantum computing comes online, it'll, it'll be, be the engine that fires artificial intelligence. That's all happening in this decade. Um, we need to we need to win that race. And here I would recommend to the audience, many of you will have read it already or heard of it, the excellent National Security Report on Artificial Intelligence by Eric Schmidt and Bob Work. You know, who are those two guys? Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, former, and Bob Work, the former Deputy Secretary of Defense, dear friend, uh, shipmate from the Pentagon, one of the absolute smartest people I know. Um, read that report. So number two, and I, I, I throw out artificial intelligence as an avatar, if you will, of the technology race we're going to have to follow, following our ability to imagine. And then third, and finally, in, in this context, I think as we look at technologies, as we uncover them and use them, we need to be consciously thinking about the dual use capability that is built into this. Example, um, solar power and um, the development of highly efficient batteries. Um, this is something that we're sort of scratching the edges of. Um, this is the kind of technology that has tremendous military application, but potentially even bigger 
uh, even bigger application in other um, in other venues. So there's three quick ideas. Um, I'll, I'll finally I'll add uh, part of this is going to be, and I think I think um, our colleague from Lockheed Martin mentioned this: uh, rare earths, strategic minerals, um, mm -hmm. uh, lithium in particular with batteries comes to mind. Um, we have to be thinking out in front of the problem. The, you know, the Wayne Gretzky go skate where the puck is headed. Um, and that means thinking coherently about supply chains and materials that we're going to need to execute the three things I just talked about. I couldn't agree more with you. And I do think like every uh, sort of national security risk that the U.S. is facing right now, the private sector plays such an important role. And I think Christopher's comments on that um, really helped us sort of see from that filter, if you will, um, how they're thinking about these issues. Um, okay, uh, Richard Ersted says, it seems to me that addressing root causes of climate change globally is going to need close collaboration between China and the U.S. and other allies. So what can the U.S. do now to try to work out rules of the road for this kind of collaboration and what should China do? He says, what incentives are there for both powers to at least wall this off from other points of conflict? Such a good question given where we are right now. Yeah, and the, and the answer is built right into the question, like all good questions. Um, it is... Uh, I always say we need to bend the relationship with China, right? I mean, we are not going to allow them ownership of the South China Sea. That's bending the relationship. We are not going to uh, acquiesce in them rolling like steamrollers over our allies in the region, the Japanese, the Filipinos, et cetera. We're going to bend those relations. We're going to continue to challenge them on human rights, even though those are internal to China. There are international norms there. We're not going to acquiesce in ongoing cyber attacks. We're going to bend the relationship, but boy, we better avoid breaking it and ending up in a war. That's really the point of the book, 2034. So to this excellent question, I would argue that what we need with China is a, a strategy of confront where we must, but cooperate wherever we can. And there are potential zones of cooperation out there, and a huge one with big blinking green lights on it, I'll make them green, green lights are blinking, um, is, is climate. Um, yeah. Both nations have a vested interest in getting this right. Um, you know, as the saying goes, you know, there's no plan B, there's no planet B. We got to get, we got, we, the big we, we've got to get this right. And by the way, it's not just China. I mean, this is where we can cooperate with the Russian Federation. This is where we can cooperate with Iran and North Korea. This is something like counter piracy that transcends our political disagreements, which are quite significant and need to be resolved. Um, and I, I kind of like the idea, he used the expression walling it off. Yeah. I, I like that, but I think maybe a better approach, and this would be debatable, would be to kind of integrate it and to say to Beijing, hey, you need cooperation on this, we want cooperation on that. We'll we'll work with you on this. You've got to give a little over here on where we're confronting. So how you structure it um, remains to be seen. Climate, certainly a part of it. I'll give you two other zones of cooperation, both of which touch environmental issues. One is pandemics. You know, newsflash, there are going to be additional pandemics. They're going to come with more frequency, I, I fear, in the future because we are packed in together in cities, urbanization is growing, these viruses are mutating constantly. You know, we've got some good tools to deal with it, but pandemics will come again. And therefore, just as we were unable to imagine the pandemic of 2020, small number of people did, but the vast majority never gave it a thought. Now we ought to be collectively imagining it Part of getting that right is going to be international cooperation. It's going to be hard digging out of the, you know, the resentments and the anger that kind of flow both ways. This pandemic originated in China, obviously, that's got a lot of angst attached to it. But I, I'll tell you, we've got to rise above that and get to cooperation to be ready for the next one. So climate, pandemics, and a third one, and it's really low-hanging fruit, is disaster relief. Um, particularly, you know, see paragraph one about a lot more storms, a lot more fires. Uh, can we work together? The United States has two big, beautiful hospital ships. Everybody got to 
get a look at them early in the pandemic, mercy and comfort. I commanded comfort on multiple deployments when I was commander U.S. Southern Command. China has hospital ships. Could they operate together? Hey, they already have. They did it in a exercise in RIMPAC. They did some nascent cooperation in the Indian Ocean. I think uh, medical diplomacy and disaster relief would be a potential area of cooperation. I'll give you a fourth one since I'm on a roll here. And I mentioned it earlier, it's the guardianship of the oceans. And you know, again, it's complicated. China has far ranging fishing fleets that uh, many observers believe are trotting on the rights of other nations. But over time, all of us have a vested interest in the health of the oceans. Could our coast guards work together? Another potential zone. So point being, confront where we must, cooperate where we can, uh, and yes, climate will be, I think, the best bet of doing that. I think if there's one person, Admiral, that I don't uh, want to be right now, it would be John Kerry, who had the president's special envoy on this, because he's got to figure out uh, how to create that roadmap on where you work with China and, and where you don't sort of wall things off or do you integrate. He's got to be the one to come up with that formula. He really, he really does. And let me give you a snapshot of Senator Kerry, who I, I know quite well from testifying uh, Senate Foreign Relations days. And then when I was dean of the Fletcher School, he had a very close relationship with uh, Tufts and with the Fletcher School. And I'll give you a snapshot. Um, three years ago, maybe two years ago, um, I was at a, a relatively small lunch in uh, Munich at the Munich Security Conference. And, you know, we were going through the usual uh, selection of, of national security concerns everybody had all the time, you know, the invasion of Ukraine and what are we going to do about North Korea and uh, the usual basket. And John Kerry very politely said to the moderator, could I just say a word? And he got up and delivered, you know, kind of a seven minute off the top of his head speech about exactly your question, about climate, about why we got to get this right, laid out the modalities. You know, he's pretty well positioned to do this. Former Secretary of State uh, of Senate Foreign Relations Committee, knows the players, has the confidence of the president. I think I think he's a good bet for this. But boy, are you right. He's really got his hands full. I mean, it you know, becomes like a punchline to a joke, right? Which is, uh, you know, Middle East peace plan. You know, hey, let me see that climate story again. Uh, I think I think short of trying to come up with Middle East peace, he does have the toughest hand of cards of anybody. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Um, here's a question from Larry Pfeiffer. Um, and Larry, it's great to have you with us today. And Larry, of course, runs the excellent Hayden Center over at uh, George Mason University. Larry says, what will national security leaders be looking to the U.S. intelligence community to provide to support climate change policy making? And is this more of a question of exploiting open source information or using intelligence assets, both technical and human? I, I love getting right into the nitty gritty like that. Well, for a cipher brief audience, that's certainly the right question to be answered. And, and I couldn't agree again with the uh, thrust of the question, which is, you know, it's really important to know how many tanks North Korea has, and I want to know that. And I, I know the commander of Indo-Pacific wants to know that, and he wants to know it today in case he's got to fight tonight, as the saying goes. But if you're going to do the kind of things that this call is predicated upon, um, we are going to need the intelligence community to uh, do the following. Um, prioritize, at least to some degree, our overhead sensor capability to show us climatological patterns. This might include the use of hyperspectral imagery, um, satellite-based, long-haul aircraft-based, um, help us, us, the national security community, understand what's happening in that climatological world. So I think that's first and most obvious. Secondly, um, help us understand the kind of um, challenges that I outlined earlier. And here I, I would want the intelligence community to weigh in and say, you know, Admiral, you're, you're really right about the Arctic. You're kind of less right about, you know, storms and fires, oceans. We just don't have a clear picture. But take all that intellectual firepower that's out at Langley and, and everywhere else around the circuit and fashion at least a portion of it on these mm -hmm. challenges to validate them. 
Um, number three, um, I know you are as well, Suzanne. I'm a big fan of red cells, red teaming. CIA red cell is just a, a national treasure. Um, you need iconoclastic contrarian thinkers who will take you to the far end of where this goes, both good and bad. And so putting these kind of challenges and problems in, in the hands of those particular intellians, I think makes a lot of sense. And then fourth and finally, at the operational level, um, we ought to, and all the military services have uh, meteorological experts, you know, in the Navy, we have our cadre of oceanographers. Um, all of the services have these. Resource them, give them uh, the tools they need, give them the challenges. And I think you'll see the Department of Defense potentially being a pretty significant contributor on the scientific side of this as well. So there's four quick ideas that, that flow kind of at that nexus of intelligence operations and uh, natural science, if you will. And I love this Cypher Brief community because um, uh, Director Robert Cardillo, who of course uh, was director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which uh, he was preceded in that role by General Clapper, both on the call with us today. Um, we're already planning to talk to uh, Director Cardillo. We're just nailing down a date for the briefing on climate and how you know the NGA and its intelligence mission sort of took that on, how he sees that developing as well. And, and, and let me say um, with complete credit where credit is due, a number of my views in this area have been shaped by another superb director of NGA, Director Tish Long. Yeah. Uh, Tish uh, was, of course, a Navy civilian intelligence uh, person for many, many years. That's how I got to know her, then made the leap over to run the NGA. And she is one of the absolute top shelf thinkers on all this. And, uh, you know, I never, never say no to an NGA director, I guess. <laughs> I'm sure all the NGA directors appreciate that. Um, okay, Michelle de Grutolo, I hope I said that right, Michelle, um, asks, are we including climate change into our war games and future threat scenarios? So we've we've already said it's a great idea. You and I are both fans. Is it actually being done? I think it is to a very limited degree. Um, I know as I was finishing up my time as Supreme Allied Commander, we did in fact have some climate thinking built in um, under Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mabus. Um, you may remember the, the great green fleet ideas um, didn't perhaps achieve the full potential that the secretary wanted, but that idea of understanding the environment and building it into our thinking, not only on war games, but also on our procurement um, on our consumption of fuel, our use of uh, solar power. I think all of that is kind of edging into the conversation. And, uh, you know, those who know me know I'm apolitical. You know, I was vetted for vice president by Hillary Clinton, one of six people actually vetted. I was offered a cabinet post by Donald Trump. You know, I think of that as two bullets whizzing by my head. <laughs> but I will say this. Um, when administrations change, ideas and emphasis changes. And so going from the Trump uh, team to the Biden team, you're going to see environmental ideas come in more into the slipstream of conversations, uh, both on the procurement side and on the operational side. So short answer, yes. And I would buy that stock. I think it's going to go up over the next four years. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that on the politics side, because there are a number of experts who we have and we work with who don't agree always from a political perspective, who agree a lot on the national security issues that we're facing. And it's a place where we can come to the table together uh, and actually do good things. And I'm just so grateful that we have that kind of leadership from folks like you and others uh, that can strip the politics away when needed. And it's clearly needed. Um, so let me just come to you now. I mean, I can't, I told you an hour was going to go by like really fast. Um, and there's so much more that we can follow up on here, but I think you've just given us some really great overview of kind of how you see this threat where it is right now, what our long-term strategy needs to be, but also some of the things to think about in sort of helping to mitigate what we're facing right now and, and be prepared um, for what might be, you know, a little closer than we're comfortable with as we're waiting for your next novel. Um, but let me ask you, um, just for some closing thoughts uh, today, you know, as, as 
We have a number of folks from all, all sorts of industries on the call with us today. We've got finance, we've got critical infrastructure, we've got allied partners from around the world on this call today. Just leave us with a few kind of closing thoughts about what we should keep in mind when it comes to climate near term. Yeah, let me actually, if I can, structure it uh, strategic, operational, and uh, tactical. And I'll, I'll do those in reverse order. I think tactically, um, we just need to be ready to respond to the kinds of short-term tactical disruptions that we have discussed here. So storms, fires, uh, training our military to do that. Um, I think all of that is is vitally important and um, and is is a very real consequence of of climate change um, operationally. So here I mean broad area operations going out to sea. I think um, this is where industry can really help the most um, in the relatively short term, and that's in pursuing um, technologies that are climatologically responsible. Um, so more solar, more wind, um, better battery storage we've talked about, um, pollution uh, reductions, sensors that allow us to see when others are polluting, um, overhead capability. Again, I mentioned spectral imagery, um, that ability to, uh, to really discern what's happening on the surface. I think all of those are kind of operational sorts of things. And tied to that is um, the specifics of, and this kind of is on the, the bridge between tactical and operational, but it's, you know, the Department of Defense is the largest organization in the world. You know, it's a 700 plus billion dollar budget. It's, I don't know, two and a half million people. It operates all around the world. It burns a lot of fuel. It turns on a lot of lights. I mean, you know, there's a, um, a we need technologies that help us conserve that, and we need to teach our people about it. So that's kind of the tactical operational blend. Strategically, I think, is a different conversation. This is um, how do we begin to shape the geopolitics of the world so that this does become a leading cause of cooperation. I mean, this is you know, we want to save the planet, right? But we also want to avoid a war on the planet. And a pretty good way to avoid wars, as I said earlier, is to find zones of cooperation. This is a significant one, potentially. And so um, leading, and, and here I applaud the Biden team, day one coming back into the Paris Climate Agreement, makes a lot of sense. Um, teaming with China, in particular to provide leadership in that zone makes a lot of sense. Um, strategically shaping the geopolitics so we can have cooperative zones, I think is our, our best hope uh, long-term for the planet. And then I'll just close by perhaps the obvious com comment, which is, you know, this is everybody's business. And um, we, we can't just walk away from it. We, we say in the Navy, you know, People perhaps don't know this, but basically everybody assigned to a ship is a trained firefighter. Did you mm -hmm. know that? Everybody on a ship's crew goes through a three-day firefighting course, pretty sophisticated one, annual refreshers. We practice it all the time. Sometimes we fail, as in Bonhomme Richard, the terrible fire in the shipyard. But 99 times out of 100, we defeat the fire. But why is that? Why do we do all that training? The answer is because when you're on a ship at sea, if your ship's on fire and it gets out of control, you can't just walk across the street and wait for it to go out. It's yours. And that's kind of climate. It's, there is no planet B. And so we've <laughs> kind of <laughs> got to get this one right. And that's going to require all the kinds of things we've talked about that in the end go vastly beyond uh, our Department of Defense and our national security community and really are part of a huge global community. But we can play a part, I think a very important part. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be with you, Suzanne. I love the way you think. Thank you so much for your leadership uh, on this and for being so willing and so kind with your time to share your expertise. We very much appreciate having you. One of my very favorite people in the world to talk to. Thank thanks you so much. Okay, thanks everybody in the community.
<laughs> well, I'd like to thank um, our expert today, um, also to Christopher Geiger and Lockheed Martin for their incredible support so that we can allow these things to happen. And we hope that you can join us next week on August 10th. We're going to be welcoming Cypher Brief expert Norm Rule for a briefing on the Middle East, if you're following at all in the headlines, and I hope you are by listening to our daily open source podcast in the morning about what's been going on in that region. There's a lot, and there are a few things that have happened just recently that could be changing dynamics a little bit quicker over there. So we're gonna welcome Norm for a briefing on that. Uh, we're also gonna be hearing his expert insights on Iran's new president and that latest drone attack that I mentioned. Um, details are in our morning newsletter for that. Um, this is a members only briefing. So if you have flirted with the idea before becoming a full member, but you haven't yet done it, I don't think it's going to break you. It's about 10 bucks a month and the best $10 a month you can spend on getting true expert national security insights. It helps us be able to bring you these fantastic conversations like the one we just heard with Admiral Stavridis. I hope to, so, I hope to see you. I hope to have some English speaking lessons and I hope to see you on the 10th. Until then, please do follow our open source podcast. It's daily Monday through Friday. You can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts. Thanks so much. Take care. We'll see you next time.